Let's enjoy some time around the Word of God tonight. Evening meditation. Got my Bible in my hand, and I'm interested in Job chapter number 24. Job 24. We're journeying through the book of Job. Job is still talking, reasoning, trying to figure out what's going on in his life. Things have become difficult, dreary, discouraging. He is unable to get a word from God. He has friends who are accusing him of sins that he knows he has not committed. Listen to him as he wrestles within himself. Verse 1, chapter 24. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? He begins wondering this. Everything is in God's hands. The time of blessing, the time of judgment, the time of the first coming of the Lord, the time of the second coming of the Lord. But they that know him, Job does, a lot of it we don't see. A lot of it we don't understand. Just this sentence, we got to get on into verses 2 and 3. When you can't understand, just believe. When you can't explain, just trust. When you're in over your head, thank God you know the lifeguard. You know the one who's in control. Job wants to get a handle. It said the men of Issachar were wise because they had an understanding of the times. Job wants to see a time when God judges sin. He wants to see a time when God will make right all the things he has suffered. When God will rebuke his accusers who have told him that he's got mountains of unconfessed sin in his life. Now, Job's going to consider the ungodly for a little bit. You must remember what Elihu, Bildad, and Zophar have said, Job, you must be ungodly. There's no telling the kind of sins you've committed because God has taken away your children. God has taken away your livelihood. God has turned your wife's heart against you. Uh, God has uh, uh, ruined your health. He's taken your good health. You surely are a bad, big, rebellious sinner. Verse 2. Job said, I know some people who remove landmarks. Now let me tell you what that means. They go out at night and they move their fence. Move their fence so they've got a little more of their neighbor's land now and he's got a little less. They're stealing property. I know people that remove landmarks and violently take away flocks. They steal. They steal sheep from some poor little man who has very little. Verse 3, I, I know a crowd, and they drive away the donkeys, the ass of the fatherless. They're now picking on little orphans who've grown up, no doubt, but they're just as poor as they can be. Uh, Job said that crowd, they'll take the widow's ox for a pledge. Poor widow. She's got one ox. That's how she gets her little acre plowed. And uh, that, that's how it's part of her life. And they take it away because she can't pay a debt or something. Oh, my. They abuse the poor. They abuse the widows. They abuse the fatherless, the orphans. Job said uh, they're so ugly to the poor that the poor have to go out into the desert to find some work and, uh, and, and they have to just be scavengers for uh, their food. Verse 6, they'll reap in the cornfields over it. They have to glean for a little bit of wheat to get them by. Verse 7 says that same crowd, they'll cause the naked to lodge without clothing. They know of some folks that don't have clothing and then they won't lift a finger to provide them for that. They won't even cover them when they're, uh, it's winter and when they're in the cold. That's the kind of person that he is describing. They'll take away the sheaf. 
I mean a beggar's portion. They'll take away the sheep from the hungry. Ungodly people. Ungodly people. And then listen to verse 10. Some of you may have wondered the same thing. Yet God layeth not folly to them. All these wicked people committing all these atrocious acts, abusing everybody coming and going, and yet God doesn't even seem to notice it. God layeth not folly to them. Now don't you get upset with Job. He is reasoning deep down in his mind and he cannot understand why God is judging him, why God's coming down so hard on a righteous man. And yet God lets these wicked people off apparently scot-free. That's the rationale that has compassed Job's heart this evening. Why? Why? Won't there ever come a time that God's going to judge the wicked? Same chapter of Job 24, verses 13 through 17. Listen to these people. I think the point of this paragraph, they're getting light and darkness mixed up. Day and night. And remember in the Bible, darkness and night sometimes represent sin. And light and brilliance sometimes represent the Lord Jesus and righteousness and godliness and purity. There are those that rebel against the light. Job says, I know some folks and they can't stand the light of God's Word. He's going to name three kinds of these wicked people. The murderer. The murderer. He'll go out at night like a thief and he'll kill somebody. He ought to be working all day, but he's going out at night. The murderer. The murderer. Verse 15. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, darkness to fall. And he says, nobody will see me, not in the darkness. And he disguises his face. Then he goes out to a house of some pretty woman, but questionable morals. And, 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 and they dig through the houses uh, that they had marked for themselves in the daytime. They do it at night, their adulterous activity. Nobody seems to do anything to the murderer. Looks like the adulterer's getting off scot-free. And then, and then in the same paragraph, I'll not read it all, he mentions the thief. And the thief can steal, but it seems like there's never any reparation that has to be made. There's never any payback. Job is wondering. Do you all see where he's coming from? I think I do. God let me, ten kids die, they're buried on the hill. I had enough camels to keep me in business for the rest of my... God took away my camels or He let it be done. And my donkeys. And my sheep. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 God is whipping me. God is judging me. God's wrath is falling on me. But not on the wicked. Not on the murderers. Not on the adulterers. Not on... The thieves. Job's heart can't understand it. Now somebody's going to say, well, Job's sin right there. You've not convinced me of that. He's wondering in his heart, and he's honest enough to be open with an almighty God. Then, in verse 18, watch this. I don't know how to explain it. The commentators say this is one of the hardest chapters in Job, but I want to grapple with it with you. I want us to reason through it. The wicked is as swift as the waters. Waters that are here and then gone. Job is absolutely turned tables. He said, I'll tell you about the wicked. God's going to deal with them. They're swift as their waters. They're here today and they'll be gone tomorrow. Their portion is cursed. Everything they own, God's going to curse it here in this earth. Just like dry weather dries up the snow, uh, waters that are flowing out of the mountains are dry. Water, so the grave of those that sin, it's going to be sure God's going to put them in their grave. And said, the womb will forget that wicked man and the worm shall feed on him. 
Job has gone absolutely 180 degrees the other way. God's going to judge that wicked man. His mama's going to, he's a bad son. God, his mama's going to forget that she bore him. Uh, the worms are going to eat him alive. He's dead, but the live worms are going to be eating him. His corpse down in the ground. He'll be no more remembered. He'll be, his wickedness will be like that tree that's fallen over that's dead over yonder. Can you all tell that Job is confused? Can you tell him that he wants to believe, but evidence says, I don't know if God judges the wicked or not, and yet he knows God said the soul that sinneth shall die. Yet he knows it hadn't been written yet. Be sure your sins will find you out. Oh my. Here we go. Have you ever had days like that where you're up and down? You ever had days like that where you believe and then you wonder? You ever had days you couldn't wait to get to church and then some days you just soon not go to church? Paul had those days. He discusses them at length, I think, in Romans chapter 7. He said, I want to do good, but when I want to do good, something in me doesn't want me to do good. It's an inner battle. It's an inner struggle. Job wants to believe God's going to judge iniquity, though it looks like everybody's getting by without his judgment right now. But we're not even to the toughest part of the chapter. Verse 23. Evil, he evil, the evil man entreateth the barren that beareth not. He's ugly to the motherless uh, bride who's so bad. He's ugly to her and mean to. He does no good to the widow. He, he, th 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 this wicked man, uh, his eyes are on the ways of the innocent. He's looking for another victim to slay, another victim to help. The victims of this wicked man, uh, they'll, they're here for a little while, but soon they're gone, they're brought low, uh, and they'll be cut off as the tops of the ears of corn, uh, as the kernels of wheat. Now, he's flip-flopped again. It's like the wicked's getting by with everything. No, no, no. There's a God in heaven. He's going to judge the wicked as sure as I'm standing here. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. The wages of sin is dead. And now he's back again. Looks like the a wicked man. He sets his mark. He gets his prey. He destroys them. He gobbles them up. He eats them alive. I, I, I don't know. Back and forth. Back and forth. I told you earlier, but let me tell you again. Everybody doesn't get to see every single evening meditation. An old British preacher named Joseph Parker said it. Listen. No Christian is probably all the time as good as his best day. I know I'm not good as my best day every day. I don't reach the height of desire to study my Bible. I don't reach the height of prayer power every day that I have on my better days. No man is as good as his best day. And then hallelujah, no lady, no man is as bad. Christian man is as bad as his worst day. Aren't you thankful for that? I've had some low days. Days when I've laid loved ones in the grave, they've been bad days. I've not cursed God, I've not doubted God, but oh how, oh how my heart hurt. I didn't read a lot in my Bible those days. I, I don't think I shouted much those days. I was grieving those days. My bad day. I'm not always as good as my best day. I'm not always as low as my worst day. Job's having a tough, tough day. Job's grappling with some issues. But I'll tell you something. This low day in Job's life, he still doesn't deny God. He still doesn't curse God. He still does not deny the existence of God. He says it looks like God doesn't judge him, but I know God's going to judge him. Uh, and, and, and then again, it looks like they're getting by with everything. Job is topsy-turvy for a while. But though he's topsy-turvy, he's hanging on to God. Though he's topsy-turvy, he knows there's an anchor. Oh, when you go through those hard times, Brother Bagwell, when you go through those times of turmoil, when the old devil, Jesus said it to Peter, is sifting you in a sifter, he's sifting you as wheat, you're rolling in a barrel down the hill. Remember, there is a God, 
and he's got his eye on you. And he still loves you. And he loves you with every fiber of his being. He loves you with all. He loves you with all of his heart. I wrote this down. I've got to close my meditation. I have to go preach in a few minutes in a sweet revival meeting. The inactivity of God is not proof of his disfavor. i got to say it again. God's inactivity is not proof of his disfavor. I'm talking to somebody and you haven't seen God working a lot in your life lately. Not as many prayers answered. You've had nowhere near the blessings that somebody over the ways had and they're nowhere near apparently the Christian you are. God just hadn't done much, preacher. I, I don't doubt him. I know he's there. I, I'll never turn again. But, but, but it just seems like I am in the cloudy, stormy time of my life. The inactivity of God is not proof of his disfavor. Because the prayers hadn't been answered, because the Bible reading hasn't been as thrilling, because the church services, you've been there, but they've not been as helpful. That doesn't mean you're in God's disfavor. That doesn't mean God's mad at you. It might mean God's trying and testing you so you can come forth as gold. It might mean God's got you in the fire so God can stick his tongue out at the devil and say, devil, this child of mine did not fail. He did not bolt. She did not run. They stayed true to my name. Peter called it the manifold grace of God. I looked up that word. It means the multicolored grace of God. If you need green grace today, God's got you some green grace. I'm illustrating. If you need red grace, He's got it. If you need blue grace, He's got it. If you need indigo, every type of grace you need, God's got it. And He's got the color of grace you need right now in your life when it looks like God is inactive. When you're wondering why he didn't judge the wrong that was done to you. When you're wondering why he took away or seems to be taking away that thing that is so precious to you. Write this down. It's worth, it's, it's worth remembering. Disaster. I preach, I don't know if I've had disaster. I'll use a different word. Catastrophe. Hard times. Difficulties. Overtake both the vicious and the virtuous. Hard times are going to happen to the sinner and the saint. It's a product of living in a sin-cursed world. We can thank Adam and Eve for it. Heartache comes to the vicious and the virtuous. The vicious will curse God when it comes. The virtuous will say, I don't know all God's doing. His times I don't always discern, but I'll believe in Him. And I'll trust him. Be the virtuous one in the hard times, not the vicious one. Can I close with this thought? And I merely passed over it when I read it. Verse 1, talking about times that are not hidden from the Almighty. Job calls God in this chapter Almighty. Job's got doubts. Job's got some wonderings. Job's topsy-turvy, on and off, up and down, hot and cold. But he knows this. I need an amen. There is an almighty God. There is an almighty God who knows the answer. There is an almighty God who's in control. There is an almighty God and hallelujah. Well, I need an amen. We're going to see him someday. And God almighty is for you. Dear Christian friend, God Almighty loves you too. Oh, that word Almighty, El Shaddai. God Almighty. Just the word Almighty, Shaddai. Shaddai. I'm going to go off the air talking about that word. In the midst of your turmoil, in the midst of your doubts, in the midst of your inner questionings of your heart and soul, yet you're determined to hang on to God. Almighty. Almighty, shad is the root. It's a little noun, shad. Let me tell you what it means. You can look it up when we get off uh, of our evening meditation. It is the word for breast. Now, Brother Bagel, for goodness sake, what do you... God Almighty literally says He's the God of the breast. 
I hope this will help somebody who's going through a hard time. I hope this will help somebody. The devil's been fighting you with all the fervor he can muster. I hope this will help somebody and, and you've wondered and you've, you've questioned and, and yet you're, you're determined you're going to keep loving him. Almighty God, El Shaddai, and it means breast. In Hebrew culture, the breast and it's feminine. It's the mother's breast. It's the woman's breast. I have to say this delicately and tactfully. I sure don't want to say anything inappropriate. But I will tell you this about mama's breast. It is comforting, warm and loving, receptive. Get me an amen. Nourishing, strengthening. It brings security to a life. God said, Job... It looks like I'm not judging some of them and I've come down hard on you. I'll explain it someday. Keep trusting me. I'm the God of the breast. Job, one of these days, I'm going to pick you up. And uh, I, I'm going, yes, I know he is our Father God, our Father who art in heaven. But I didn't call El Shaddai. He named himself El Shaddai. He's the God of the breast. He's the God who'll love us. He's the God who'll comfort us. He's the God who'll warm us. He's the God who'll dote upon us. He's the God who will nourish us. He's the God who will give us the sweet, sweet milk of His sustenance. He's the God who will not lay us aside. He's the God who let God in His breast love you, nurture you, and encourage you tonight, this evening. God Almighty on your side. Hallelujah to His name. It's raining. I don't know if you can tell that. Brother Bagel, you're preaching from the car. Yes, I left the house the church has provided for us for the week. And I was going over by the Tennessee River. That's what it is back there. That's the Tennessee River. Had my easel and my camera set up, ready to start preaching, and the rain began to fall. I could have preached in the rain. I've done that before. But I didn't want it to run my little camera. So I just got in the car, got out my Bible, and with the rain falling in the river behind me, I've talked to you about the great God who is the breasted one, the loving, tender, kind, nourishing, warming, precious one. Climb up in his lap. John, the disciple, he leaned on Jesus' breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved, we call him. Climb up in his lap tonight. Lean over against his strong arms. He's got them everlasting arms underneath you, you know. Lean over on his breast. And let him love you and warm you and nourish you. River. I never see a river, but I think of Isaiah's words, peace like a river. Get in his arms. Snuggle up in his bosom. Enjoy his peace. Enjoy his peace. Doubts, they'll happen. Questions, they'll come. Just hang on. Climb up into his lap. The one who loves you dearly. Hallelujah to his name. Study those names of God. It's worth spending some time studying those names of God. El Shaddai.